Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Christina Byrne, and I'm the Public Outreach Department Manager for the Orange County um, Depart uh, Transportation Agency. And we will be getting started in just a minute. Um, we're just going to go ahead and let people um, join us. We have quite a few participants we're expecting this evening. So I just want to give a minute or so for people to go ahead and log in. So we'll be with you in just a minute. Again, my name is Christina Byrne, and I'm the department manager at OCTA of Public Outreach, and I'm with the Orange County Transportation Authority. We will be getting started in just a moment. We are going to have quite a few participants joining us this evening, so I encourage you to utilize the chat function that is at the bottom of your screen um, and the Q&A function as well. Um, and then we will also um, be taking verbal comments um, at the end of the session. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started in just one minute. Um, the first slide is our meeting format. This meeting is being recorded accurately to capture your input. We are receiving all verbal comments um, during the presentation as well as the listening session. The written comments and questions can be submitted through the Q&A, which again is at the bottom of your screen. Both written and verbal comments are equally considered by our team for consideration as we move forward with this um, Coastal Rail Resiliency study, study. And if you would like to speak, please use the raise your hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. State your name prior to providing your comment, and that will be very helpful for us. That we will be constantly monitoring um, the chat and the raise your hand function. So please don't hesitate to utilize either of those if you'd like to make a comment. Next slide, please. With that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Dan Fu to introduce himself and go through the agenda today. Okay, thank you, Christina. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Fu. I'm the project manager and I'm uh, with the Orange County Transportation Authority, the planning division. So I'll give a really quick overview on the study that uh, that is currently underway. And then uh, Christina is gonna jump into the study outreach effort and then we'll get started with the listening session. So I'll just give really a high level history uh, in terms of what's transpired over the last uh, several years, as well as the goals and objectives of the short and what we call the short and midterm study, as well as what we call the potential reinforcement areas and um, in terms of uh, that those are the areas that are uh, in, uh, for, at, in, uh, in threat of um, uh, imminent uh, railroad closure. So we'll talk more about that. And then we'll talk about the study schedule as well as the outreach um, and listening session. So with that, next slide, please. So I think many of you actually have seen iterations of, of this particular slide. Um, Really, the takeaway here is OCTA's role as it relates to the railroad. So OCTA is the owner, but not the operator of the railroad. And the, uh, the operators of the railroad are really the likes of whether it's Metrolink, Amtrak, or the freight liners. Uh, in this case, in, in the southern part of Orange County, it's BNSF. And then in the northern portion of Orange County is Union Pacific. So it's roughly about 40 miles of the railroad corridor within Orange County that OCTA owns. We also have another function where um, we serve as the managing uh, agency for the Low Sand Rail Corridor Agency. That's a state uh, joint powers authority. And then we're also a member of the Southern California Regional Rail Authority or otherwise known as Metrolink. I think what is um, important about the, the study that we're looking at is it's looking at a seven mile stretch of the most critical uh, coastal uh, rail infrastructure that's down in South Orange County, and much of it is actually 200 feet or less from the coastline. So next slide, please. So this particular slide, uh, again, many folks have uh, on, on the call uh, or joining us tonight have seen this. First 130 years, you're looking at a single handful of closures, 1933, 38, and then the early 1990s. But since 2021, which is literally um, three years ago, a little less than three years ago, we have experienced five closures on the railroad. So that prompts us to 
really uh, need to take an action in terms of looking at what are the underlying issues and then what are ways to minimize any more closures um, that we're experiencing. Next slide. So here is just uh, a, a pictorial um, of, of the changing conditions from the 1970s all the way through 2021. Is, uh, I think what's important about this is not only is the beach width different from the 70s to the 2020s, you can see that the development has uh, matured and changed quite a bit over the decades. So that's the other uh, key part of this is uh, we're in very much an urbanized area as compared to the early 1970s. Next slide. So this particular slide is really the work of UCI, Dr. Brett Sanders and um, Daniel Call, who basically looked at the, um, the beach width in both the San Pedro cell as well as the Oceanside cell. And that particular uh, graphic on the upper, on the top side shows the San Pedro cell. And it shows that during that 20 year period, we, we generally, there's a uh, net gain in terms of the beach width However, uh, one can't necessarily make that same uh, conclusion with respect to the ocean size cell. So it's really more of a recent research that we have been able to um, understand better what, what has been going on over the last two decades. But it is important to note that when you're looking at pe uh, weather patterns, um, I think that's one of the limitations is we really need to also look at many, many decades before to see the, uh, the change in weather patterns. So I think that is something that we're hoping that the likes of Dr. Sanders and others are able to discern from even previous decades. Next slide, please. So this uh, on this particular uh, chart here or uh, table here, it re really the key is just showing that there's been a lot going on with respect to the OCTA rail right away with the four projects that's shown on there at the same time with this particular study, we're trying to take advantage of and to the extent possible integrate the work of others. And in this case, it shows the two projects that the city of San Clemente uh, are currently underway with in terms of uh, first is the Army Corps sand replenishment project that they're partnering with the city of San Clemente and the second one is the San Clemente Nature Base um, Feasibility Study, which is funded by the Coastal Commission. Next slide, please. So the what I've shared with everyone a moment ago in terms of the graphic that shows since um, 2021, we've had five closures that prompted us to really take a hard look at what can be done in terms of the short and midterm and then what uh, would need to be done in the long term. So we separated that uh, effectively into two bins. The right side where it says long term, that's really more of the coastal retreat strategies, potentially looking at realigning the seven mile stretch of the railroad to somewhere inland. Um, I know there's been talks of and, and actually uh, Caltrans and Lowsand have looked at an inland project many, many years ago, back in two, between 2002 and 2009. So that is something that um, is part of the long-term coastal retreat strategies. So there needs to be a revisit of what they have done and then build it from there. But in terms of what's germane to the dis uh, discussion tonight uh, is really looking at the short term. What are solutions that can be done that will get us basically protect the railroad in place over the next decade or so, and then uh, over the medium term, which is uh, solutions that would protect the railroad over several decades. In the meantime, other efforts are underway to look at potentially some sort of a coastal retreat strategy. So next slide, please. So in terms of the goals and objectives of the initial assessment, there's been a lot of uh, uh, I think misunderstanding and, and concerns about what came out of the initial assessment. So what, what we actually did was broke the study into kind of three phases. There's the short term and the midterm that I talked about a moment ago. And then in terms of initial assessment, it's looking at areas that pose an imminent threat to the integrity of the railroad. 
So for instance, I think many folks on, on this joining us tonight are aware of what uh, transpired in uh, late January of this year with the Mariposa uh, landslide that dislodged the Mariposa pedestrian bridge. And as a result, that led to the railroad closure for a couple of months. We've since been able to uh, remediate that particular issue and service has resumed. So the idea of this initial assessment is to try to identify areas that pose that kind of a threat in the meantime, while we're working on short and medium term solutions. So what came out of that particular mini um, effort was areas that need to be monitored and then areas that are in need of immediate attention. In other words, before the next rainstorm season, which is really um, roughly about six months from now. Next slide. So this particular table and the map corresponding map to the right shows the seven areas that are in need of being monitored. They're, they're uh, by location, the mileposts, and uh, just to get uh, everyone's bearing, basically the, uh, the milepost uh, 200, which is really to the north. And then when you go down to area number seven, that's uh, all the way to the southern part of uh, the county. Next slide. So here are four areas that have been identified that are yeah, uh, in need of immediate attention. And in fact, if you look at area number three, which is on the inland side, that has already uh, unfortunately been sent in motion. This particular initial assessment, the exercise was really uh, between roughly the November 2023 timeframe through about early uh, 2024 or January of this year. And unfortunately, that all set was set in motion by the by the latter part of January, where there was a landslide, and um, and then that led to the railroad closure. So areas one, two, and four are really issues that have been identified on the seaward side, where there's essentially a lack of beach and a lack of barrier um, or buffer between the ocean and the railroad and any other structures behind that. Next slide, please. So this is area number one. It's just showing, again, the corresponding map on the right side uh, corresponds to the different areas. This is um, an area that is uh, on the north side of uh, San Clemente, and it uh, shows that there's a lack of, currently a lack of beach, and uh, th th there is a potentially an issue with the integrity of the railroad should there be another uh, storm surge. Uh, next slide, please. Similar situation here in area number two. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So area number three, this shows the uh, Mariposa pedestrian bridge before the uh, the landslide. It was, I believe this was taken the latter part of uh, 2023 and then shortly thereafter that was all set in motion. And then um, next slide, please. So area number four is the southern part. This is in the northern part of the Cypress Shore community, um, in terms of location, it's not within Cypress Shore, it's in the northern part of that community, which I believe is um, in the uh, state parks, uh, closer to the state parks area. So this is another area where there is a, a lack of um, the, the beach that will provide the buffer should there be a storm surge. So um, that's another area that's been identified as pose a uh, potential immediate threat to the railroad. Next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christina, who's gonna go over the uh, study milestones as well as the study outreach efforts. Thank you, Dan. This slide outlines the study milestones, as Dan said. First is the initial ses assessment that he mentioned previously. That assessment is available on our website as a, a PDF, and you're more than welcome to download that and read it at your leisure. That's the full report, and it is available on the website right now. Um, public outreach, I just want to reiterate, is a major part of this two-year study, and we'll have touch points throughout. The first step in our outreach process is the listening sessions, which this is what one of these are this evening. And these listening sessions are occurring from February to May of this year. Additional opportunities to provide feedback will be um, available at the initial concept development, refinement of the concepts in the draft feasibility study report. 
and we anticipate the final report in fall of 2025. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to just briefly go over the goals for today of the listening session, and it really is to hear from all of you um, from the community and document that feedback accordingly. We will, as I said, be recording. We've recorded this, and it will be available on our website after today, as well as a hard copy of the presentation in the PDF in a PDF format that also will be downloadable um, on the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study website. Both of those. And we also just want to make sure that we identify any other key stakeholders that we may not be aware of, make sure that we continue to share the expectation to maintain in place the existing coastal rail line and minimize passenger and freight service disruptions for up to 30 years, really assess any and vulnerabilities and issues of concern, and also potentially uncover opportunities to further enhance our collaboration. But most importantly, documenting feedback is our main goal. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight for all participants on this call, the feedback we've received to date. Um, we do um, document all the feedback we receive, again, in writing and verbal comments we've received at our board meetings, at our listening sessions and otherwise. And this is just a high level summary of that feedback. Considering other natural solutions such as sands, living shoreline, et cetera, seek partnering opportunities with other jurisdictions, support for early comprehensive preventive action, Continuing to coordinate with a streamlined communication of service disruptions to various stakeholders, sharing concern regarding impacts to employee commute patterns and regional tourism. And lastly, make sure we're consulting with coastal marine habitat experts. Next slide, please. Now we will begin the listening session portion of this evening. In the Q&A, we have quite a few questions. Um, if there are questions that are, or, or state, frankly, statements, I will read those as well. And also be sure to use the raise your hand function um, and we'll be able to get to you as well. So I'm just gonna go to the top. Um, the first comment is, can you tell us how you decided which residents would attend the session? It seems some residents got postcards in the mail, but others didn't. Um, I'm able to answer that question. We um, consulted the city of San Clemente and we received their database of um, any homeowners associations that they had within the city of San Clemente. We um, made sure that we verified some of those email addresses if any of the contacts were older just to make sure they're refreshed. And we um, sent out a notification to all of them. And then when it comes to the postcards you're referencing, those are actually for a separate set of listening sessions. Those are for the virtual and in-person listening sessions we're having um, coming up in, in the next few weeks. And those are for the general public. Um, next is a question regarding, are you planning a listening session specifically for Bluff residents who are a major stakeholder? We do not currently have a um, listening session scheduled specifically for Bluff residents. However, we would be happy to make sure they receive information regarding the upcoming um, virtual and in-person uh, listening sessions that are still scheduled. We did send a po that postcard that I mentioned previously was sent to more than 15,000 um, parcels within the city, about a quarter mile inland from the coastline. Um, and those should have should begin, they began dropping last week, but those will continue to drop in first class mail over the next several days. And then next, um, we have a, a, a question from Ken, and his question is, when will we see the actual ridership on the routes? Um, I watch the train daily, and it's not a quarter full. It seems as though freight could use a different route, and Amtrak could be, and Amtrak could be stopped as, as it is not viable. Um, so Dan, would you, would you want to address that? So I'm, I'm looking at the comment from Ken again. So so I, I'm not going to uh, necessarily get into the crux of that tonight. I think we're happy to look further into the ridership and, and the, the comment from Ken. So I think it's probably better to uh, look into this before we provide a response without doing the due diligence and looking into it. 
Absolutely. Um, what we could do is um, certainly if you've registered this evening, Ken, we have your email address um, so we can reach out to you separately. Um, and so next, I would want to read uh, Gregory Ray's comment. He said, will a copy of this slide presentation be available? Yes, again, it will be available on the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study website, um, as well as the recording of tonight's listening session. And I would point out that all listening sessions that have occurred to date, those PowerPoint presentations and recordings are available on our website as well. And then Ken Salter has a comment for area four. What is the scope of the revetment? Did you want me to go ahead and- Yes, please. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask uh, George Waska, who is from HDR Engineering, to provide a little more uh, detail on this and perhaps go back to the particular slide, area number four, where we had the, uh, we had shown the potential issue as well as the potential solution. Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, so the picture here on the left uh, depicts um, just the, the existing condition. You could see kind of to scale um, a person there standing. Uh, that person's about six foot tall. Uh, the railroad tracks are right on top of, uh, of that scarp. Um, and so the intent of this uh, reinforcement area here is to ensure that the uh, further uh, scouring of uh, the track embankment um, is, is basically uh, held back, held at bay. Um, also, <clears throat> the, the stretch that, was, um, that is mentioned here from milepost 206 to, to 206.67, that's uh, from the north end of the Cypress Shore area. So from that end, move it up uh, to the north. So that's uh, those are the, the limits um, as they are shown in our initial assessment. Dan, back to you. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, moving on, another comment we have is uh, Ms. Whitelaw said that we've, been, we've received a parcel map map annotated by the city of San Clemente that hotspot is not in the Cypress Shore Beach. It is not near the state beach. It is on the state beach. There should be no confusion. So that's a comment. Um, and then also a recording of our comments. Again, the full recording of today's listening session will be available on the website. Um, I don't believe we make any edits to the, the Zoom presentation. It's simply we just, uh, we just, uh, consolidate the recording and post it online. Um, they're available um, linked to our YouTube channel and then posted on the actual OCTA website. There's a comment, who has recommended support for early comprehensive preventive action? I don't know, Dan, if you want to address that, if you recall specifically who shared that feedback to us. I don't recall specifically, but I do recall one thing. So when we actually procure the, um, the contract, if you will, in terms of looking at the, uh, the short and the midterm, there were discussions among various folks and the, and the idea was to actually try to get ahead of, uh, it, it, I, I believe that's in, probably in reference to the initial assessment, so given the amount of emergencies that we've had over the last three years, so starting in uh, fall of 2021, we've ha had five closures that were, that were for an extended period. We wanted to take basically more of a proactive approach and not wait for whether it's a bluff failure or whether it's a lack of beach and lack of um, protection on the seaward side, to, and then have to be in an emergency mode to take the action, we wanted to basically look at where there are areas that pose potentially an imminent threat, and then from there determine, okay, what needs to be done so we can keep the railroad operational. So hopefully that answers the question, but that's in the context of why we ended up undertaking that initial assessment, which is really kind of breaking it up into three phases, if you will, with this 24-month study. 
Thank you, Dan. I see that Steve Lang has put in the Q&A um, that he wishes, he's raised his hand and he wishes to speak. So could we please um, unmute Mr. Lang, the president of Cypress Shore HOA? Am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you. I appreciate all you're doing. As stated, I'm the president of the Homeowners Association. I've been involved with this uh, since day one. Uh, I, about three years ago, when our landslide was just a crack, we started uh, contacting OCTA and Metro, telling them that there was a potential problem. And as the crack grew in length and width, uh, we kept uh, contacting the railroad and they basically said, uh, let us know when you solve your problem. And um, then in September 2021, I believe, uh, we had a, a major landslide and it went down uh, almost to the tracks. And then everybody, the next day we had mm, about five representatives, representatives from OCTA, which was a Friday, and the day after that, or Saturday, which and the day after that, we had 20 or 30 uh, orange vests and hard hats in our neighborhood, uh, and you know the rest of the story. The nexus of all of these issues, or not all of them on, 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 on this rail area, is the loss of our beach sand. In 2015, uh, we started noticing a huge loss in sand, and so there's a, basically the water soaked underneath through the railroad tracks into the land above and created a big sponge, a big heavy sponge. And that's what, that's what, that was the nexus and what created our landslide. And so that riprap or any kind of revetment water will still soak through and under the uh, riprap and into the, into the ground above. And there's, there's a clay seam that's about, uh, I don't know, 50 feet above ground level in our neighborhood in, that clay seam water soaks right through underneath the track. So what I can speak for at least uh, four or 500 homes, I believe that we would not want to see any more emergency armoring, riprap or revetments. We would like to see, and there are seven hotspots that you've designated. Uh, we've been told and we've studied, and uh, I think there's a lot of people that agree, including uh, Dr. Sanders, that if we dump sand, at four or five of those hotspots that we would we would be able to buy ourselves, all of us, the railroad included, three to four or five years, uh, well, so we can work this out without dumping a bunch of riprap and, and concrete and making, uh, just doing more damage to our coastline. So um, the the city of San Clemente is, as everybody knows, has the, the program to dump uh, roughly 250,000 cubic yards from Linda Lane past the pier uh, in, up in that area. And if, if we took an additional 250 to 300,000 cubic yards, in addition to that, and put it at the hotspots, uh, I, I think we think, uh, and, and anybody that knows, that would buy us several years of time without, without any cause or concern, the railroad would run and it would save money and we'd have sand back. And, uh, and so we, we are advocating nature-based, sand replenishment and uh we uh appreciate what the railroad's done what the railroad's going through i can't imagine uh it, it's it's three years ago if anybody told us what was happening now i don't know if we'd believe it but um we uh the railroad saved our neighborhood and they were great and and we had at the time just for for backup uh, the geologists for the city, for the county, for Metro, for our community, for neighboring communities, uh, ran many, many computer programs on, on what caused our landslide and the, the model, all the models that they ran, they could not get the landslide to occur if beach sand was in place. Beach sand is a natural buffer that's been there for ever. And if the, if the sand, if, if just 20 or 30% of the sand we had in 2015 was in place, we could buy three to five years. And so I want, I want to say thank you for holding these sessions. We appreciate it. We're grateful for it. But please, uh, you know, let's not, not do anything that's so damaging to our community. We it's, The whole reason we live here is for the beach. And there are surf breaks that are being damaged and can be damaged and will be damaged more if we don't if we don't watch what we're doing. And, and Mother Nature had a perfect plan before all this started. And, and man is the one that's, that's damaged it. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Mr. Lang. Again, please use the raise your hand control button and I'll be able to call on you. Um, and then um, also you can use the Zoom q and um, And also, if you would be so kind to ensure that everyone is able to speak, we kindly request that you please keep your remarks to three minutes or so. Um, certainly we want as many people as possible to talk, especially if we have differing um, perspectives this evening. So with that, um, I will go ahead and call on any other people that have their hand raised. Um, if, let's see, I'm, I, unfortunately, um, to the, my team, I'm not able to see anybody's hands that are raised. So if you could um, type in the chat somebody's name, and in the meantime, I will take another question. Um, so let's see here. Oh, Miss Whitelaw, you, you would like to speak. So we'll go ahead and um, unmute you. And so you may now speak as soon as we do. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Susie Whitelaw, Dr. Susie Whitelaw. I represent Save Our Beaches San Clemente. We have um, been uh, investigating this this proposal for quite a while now. Um, as I said, Mr. Fu, I have given you documentation that what you identify as a hotspot is not at Cypress Shores. That is definitely within the state park. And so your little hotspot that you show at the bottom is not the entirety that you want to, to do this revetment at. Do you want to do it between milepost 206, which is just north of Calafia State Beach, all the way down to 206.67, which is at the at the northern boundary between the state park and Cypress Shores. That's about two thirds of a mile. And that represents about 40% of our total public beaches. You want to build out an engineered revetment 50 feet away from the tracks on that beach where most of the beach, the high tide line is within 50 feet of the tracks. That would mean it would end up just like at the south end of the town right now, where you have waves crashing up against rock. We have plans, the city has plans to join Sandag to replenish that beach. But once you have once you've put the rocks on the beach, you make it really, really hard to replenish the beach. I ha We have a plan where we think that you can put in, just as Mr. Lang said, about 200,000 yards of sand there and over the course of five years, and you can protect your tracks with that at a cost of maybe $15 million, which is, and last time I checked, a lot less than what you're proposing. I think it's $120 million for the rock down there. I also stay at North Beach. I look at the pictures of where the rocks are, and I look at your diagram of how you're just going to set a couple of large rocks on top of that. I do not see how you're going to achieve that without increasing the width of that revetment, which we also don't want to have happen. And so I I just would like to see kind of a in in the field how you're gonna try to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um the next person I will be calling on to speak is Jefferson Berger. Yeah, it's actually Jeff Berg, B-E-R-G. Um, first of all, I'd like to second and third the uh, prior comments by Steve Lang and Ms. Whitelaw. Um, and I would just add that um, there is, with the recent uh, rains that we've had, the San Mateo Creek has broken out and um, it is dumping a lot of sand, which uh, surprisingly to a lot of people, uh, mo is actually moves to the north uh, towards the pier. And so the beach has built up very significantly in between San Mateo Creek and the south end of the riprap at Cypress Shores. And it is now actually starting to make its way um, in front of the riprap and, and down towards uh, the northern end of Cypress Shores and perhaps even to, to State Beach. I haven't been that far over the past couple of days. But the point is to follow on to the prior comments, now, now being sometime in 2024 before this next 
winter season, which we appreciate. OCTA is um, trying to put in place measures that will protect the railroad from winter storms in 2024. And that seems to be driving the haste at which you all are considering revetment and armoring, which is, you can tell, most people on this call, I'd venture to say everybody on this call <clears throat> is, is very much against because of the long-term damage to the beach. The opportunity to place sand and, and less than you would think, I, I can't argue with uh, Ms. Whitelaw's um, estimate, whether it's 100,000 cubic yards or a couple hundred thousand cubic yards, it pales in comparison to the cost of what you all have proposed to armor. And there's, there will not be a better time to place the sand uh, than there is from now over the next three to six months while we have sand that's built up. Sand begets more sand. Uh, we have a beach now that we haven't seen in front of Southgate and the riprap there on Cypress Shores. And so I would encourage you all, I know it's not easy. You've got to bring in other agencies like the Coastal Commission and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer. But we have a dredge coming back to San Clemente. Uh, we have a borrow site that has a lot of good sand, and we'd love to see OCTA work with these other agencies to increase the sand that's coming up here from 250,000 cubic yards to 500,000 cubic yards. It will put you guys in a great place for this winter, and as the other speaker said, will give us the time, OCTA as well as all stakeholders, the time to appropriately um, you know, measure, frame, and, and uh, execute on long-term plans that are not done in, in panic and haste. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berg. There's a, um, a, what, an item in the q and I'd like to get to. Has anyone addressed any financial liability from residents, homeowners associations whose property has failed and impacted the beach trail and or pedestrian bridge? Would we be able to speak to that? Or should we just use that as a comment, Dan? Has anyone addressed any financial liability from residents or homeowners associations whose property has failed and impacted the beach trail and or pedestrian bridge? So I don't think we can speak to that uh, particular issue because it's a complicated property rights issue. So I'm not uh, I'm not an attorney. I'm not equipped to kind of speak on you know on that particular matter because it, 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 what little I know of of uh, real property laws and regulations is very complex. So um, just kind of understanding that there's so many different ownerships that um, there's you know within the railroad or or uh, within the railroad right away adjacent to there are multitude of different types of ownership. So stemming from private uh, city to state and so forth. So I think that's a very complicated situation. Thank you, Dan. Um, we have a comment from Chris Nelson. Thank you um, for helping solve the Cypress Shores Bluff, but your riprap has made the loss of sand worse by making it deeper offshore. Groins and breakwaters are proven to retain sand for lots of California beaches. So why not add groins like Newport Beach did 50 years ago with no sand loss since? And now I'd like to call on uh, Miss Tony Nelson to provide a comment. We'll unmute you. Hi, thanks so much. This is Tony Nelson from Capo Cares. I know you've heard from me before, but I have more to say, I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to be brief. Number one, um, I really think it's important that you have a listening session exclusively for bluff top owners. There are, I think, about 400 homes along the bluff that really are a special constituency and should be treated differently. It's not right to just pile them all into the general session, which will be huge. Um, and I think they have some particular concerns that are different from what the general public might have. So I would really encourage you to have a bluff owners listening session. Um, number two, I'd like you to clarify what you mean by short term and long term. You keep talking about 30 years as if it's short term. 
And I'm looking at photos. There's one recently in the Orange County Register showing huge waves overtopping all that riprap you just dumped at Cypress Shore, you know, going right over the top, undermining your, um, probably undermining your track beds already. You don't have 30 years. I'm not sure that you even have three years. And I think this is so unrealistic. So I'm hoping that you're actually looking at U.S. geological uh, survey and looking at their uh, the NOAA's um, NOAA's uh, projections of what's going to happen with sea level rise because I think you're kind of missing the point. We don't have much more time on this coast, and certainly the railroad does not. And planning for thirty years to the tune of two hundred million dollars this year, it's just going to be a bigger and bigger mountain of cash. And for what? And that brings me to the my third point, and that is in business, we always do, uh, when we're contemplating a large expenditure, we always do an analysis of costs and benefits. I don't see OCTA or Sandeg or any of the stakeholders doing that kind of analysis, and you really should be. Um, this person, Ken, that asked about ridership, that is one of the supposed rider, that is one of the supposed benefits. But we actually have the data from OCTA and from uh, Metrolink telling us that the ridership is less than 50% of what it was in 2019. There are very few people on those trains. And if you consider that most of the trips are, um, are return trips, I calculate that you only have about 1,300 people a day doing return trips through this segment. That is less than even a fraction of 1% of Orange County's population. And so you're spending all of this money for a tiny segment of our population. You could easily buy them all Teslas and be done. I just don't get what benefits you're perceiving of spending all this money and ruining our beaches. Uh, and we have information on freight. Um, I encourage the audience to start reading uh, the articles that we've posted in Voice of OC. Uh, we've gone through an extensive um, data retrieval, and we have lots of statistics, and all of the information is footnoted and checked, and most of it comes from Public Records Act requests directly from the agencies. Um, the third thing is, um, I noted on your list of things that you heard from other listening sessions, you did not have one that we all said in the coastal uh, session, um, many of us talked about your desire to circumvent both CEQA and the C California Coastal Commission environmental protections. And I don't see that on your list. That is absolutely not acceptable. Mandy Sackett from Surfrider called it offensive, and it truly is offensive. And I think that should be, you know, uh, right up there at the top of your list from the listening sessions. We do not want OCTA to circumvent the normal environmental controls that are there to protect us and protect our beaches. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call on Gregory Ray. Are you one? Are you able to unmute Gregory Ray? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. My name is Gregory Ray. I'm a resident of South San Clemente. Here, our coastline has two valuable assets, the rail line and the beach. Both of these are worth preserving. In fact, as OCTA acknowledges, preserving the beach will help preserve the rail line. It's unfortunate then that in the last couple of years, OCTA has chosen to protect the rail line at the expense of the beach. In September 2021, OCTA began to install new riprap at the beach near Cypress Shore pursuant to an emergency permit issued by the Coastal Commission. This permit required OCTA to minimize the amount of beach covered and to quickly restore public access to the beach fronting the property. Despite these permit conditions, today we still have no access to the beach in front of the riprap. Furthermore, the historic walking path along the beach from the state park south to Trestles is now impassable. The residents and tourists who previously enjoyed this beautiful walking trail have had to go elsewhere. The installation of the riprap has caused the accelerated erosion of our beach sand. This is because of wave action. When waves break onto hard rock, 
they create a scouring backwash that removes sand from the beach. This result is clearly visible in the data from the Criti Critical Erosion Hotspots Report prepared for the city of San Clemente by Moffat and Nickel in June of last year. This report shows that in front of Cypress Shore, where the riprap was installed, we have lost more than 10 vertical feet of sand, starting at the shoreline and continuing more than 150 feet out into the ocean. In comparison, the other seven San Clemente beaches studied in this report showed virtually no vertical loss of beach sand. OCTA would have us believe that they would like to restore our sand, but that this has been delayed by the complexity of obtaining permits. If this is true, please show us which sand replenishment permits you have applied for in the 30 months since the emergency work was authorized. It seems incredible that you're proposing to do more armoring when you have not satisfied the conditions of the prior work after more than two and a half years have passed. Installing more rock along our coastline will cause faster erosion of our sandy beaches. Conversely, if you replenish the sand first, this will create a buffer so that you can then improve the rail line revetment without causing the scouring loss of beach sand. Here, the sequence makes a big difference. Sand first, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Um, Joe Wilson has in the in the Q&A, why is sand replenishment a parallel solution path rather than the primary solution being considered? All of your presentation in recent months have clearly positioned riprap as the primary solution being considered with token consideration for sand solutions. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Eric Anderson, has the technical team reviewed and taken into consideration the City of San Clemente Nature-Based Adaptation Project Feasibility Study, Critical Erosion Hotspots Report, which was completed in June 2023. Would you like to speak to that, Dan? So in, in reference to Mr. Anderson's comment about the City's Nature-Based Feasibility Study, um, the city actually release, unless I'm getting that confused, there's a nature-based feasibility study that the city released the first draft back in September of last year, and then they subsequently released the next iteration, I believe it was February of this year. So we had um, OCTA, Metrolink, and, and our consulting team had had meetings with the city to talk about what the nature-based solutions are and it's changed between the first iteration and, and the most current iteration. And we're uh, working with the city to try to integrate where, um, where appropriate the areas that um, are basically adjacent to the railroad or directly on the railroad where we can uh, implement and uh, incorporate some of those solutions. So th that discussion is underway with the city and um, and that's where we are with respect to that effort versus what we're looking at. Thank you, Dan. Um, another comment is there are many geologic, uh, sorry, it just skipped, many geologic and engineering studies that confirm that vibration of trains can exacerbate or even trigger landslides, especially next to wet slopes. Has OCTA done any studies of train vibration and placed any monitors on the slopes? Would you like to speak to that, Dan, or, or have Jason? I'm actually going to ask George to touch on that. Um, so George, if you would, please. Yeah, and at this time, there, uh, I don't know of any you know past studies that OCT has performed on train vibrations. Um, also, you know, the, the slopes in this area are not uh, completely owned by OCTA, and and there's a lot of adjacent landowners. Um, so any of you know vibration monitoring and any kind of other devices on the slopes will have to uh, you know be worked out with the adjacent property owners as well. But um, to my knowledge, I I don't know if if a study has been conducted for vibration monitoring through this seven mile stretch. Thank you. Um, Lisa Gant, I see that you have something in the Q&A as well as your hand up. Would you like to go ahead and, and speak at this time?
Go ahead. Did we unmute Lisa? Yes, she should have access to speak. Okay. Lisa, do you want to try speaking? I can go ahead and read your comments. Um, it says the southern end of our beach in Cypress Shore is gone. The most recent proposal only lists seawalls and boulders. The devastation has been proven. We are not in a present emergency. Why are you not respecting our city beaches and studying environmentally sound approaches, such as sand replenishment? All right, Ken Salter, why don't, why don't you go ahead and speak? Are we able to unmute Ken? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. So I just wanted to um, build on the uh, the comment on the lack of a cost benefit analysis, and uh, you know, and emphasize the fact that in order for this, you know, any fe feasibility study to be complete, it must it must have a cost benefit analysis of the various candidate solutions, um, and in particular, the cost benefit analysis should include the cost to retire the system at the end of life, which is three years isn't very far out. And uh, you know, Okta needs to pay for all of these revet the removal of all of these revetments and rip wrap and very uh, expensive infrastructure to install will be very expensive to remove. And I just want to make sure that that is weighted, no pun intended, correctly in your um, in your economic analysis on the on the wisdom of of, of this proposed solution. That's all I have. Thank you. Joe Wilson in the Q&A has stated, I would like Dan and George to address the elephant in the room. Why is OCTA not aggressively pursuing immediate sand replenishment instead of boulders? And let's see here. Uh, Mr. Sh uh, Shane, I, I just wanted to comment and agree with Dr. Whitelaw's assessment. Sand is the solution here. As a resident near Mariposa and Linda Lane, the beach is already narrowed. All residents here want a beach with sand for recreation and environmental purposes. Let's please use sand replenishment as the main solution. And now I'd like to call in Amanda Quintanilla. If you could please um, unmute yourself so you can speak. You should be able to speak now, Amanda. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, hi, how are you? Yes, my name's Amanda Quintanilla and I'm a resident of San Clemente of over 50 years. And I've been listening to the comments and I, I have to address uh, one of the concerns that uh, regarding the rough regarding the $200 million that has been proposed. Um, these are uh, it's on page uh, 18 of 21 in the um, in the uh, presentation the OCTA gave on March 11th. It's also on page 985 of 988, and it's just a rough order of magnitude. Uh, you know, and this is just the $200 million, it's plus or minus 25% or plus or minus 50%, depending on that, for certain proposals. And um, I, I think that that really needs to be emphasized because this is an estimate, uh, just like the proposals from the city of St. Clemente has for the coastal resiliency concepts, that they are given an estimate of $150 million. And in that scenario, uh, I think it was Chris Webb that said um, that there's no, nothing, um, no plans to, to even remove uh, these breakwaters or anything like that, or breakwaters or reefs. So uh, I'm glad someone had mentioned that because it, 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 it reminded me that I had to address that. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, these are proposals. I'm glad that you, uh, the OCTA is doing a study regarding this. Uh, a lot of people um, don't realize that the bluffs, again, are, are, are privately owned. Um, they, if you go look at the parcels, uh, if you go look on the city's webpage and you look at, um, you could, there's a, a map area for zoning and you could actually see the parcel parcels individually and you could tell that these lots go really almost all the way down to 
to the ground. I mean, all the way down to the bottom of the bluffs. And so they are privately owned. And I think a lot of people don't realize or as Mr. Fu said, they are jointly owned or there's HOAs involved in the ownership. And, um, you know, that that's, you know, that's a legal issue and a, a legal matter that to address. But um, I, I just wanted to say that um, I think that it's really important to get the correct information out there, which um, I'm seeing the OCTA doing, and I'm really glad about that. I've had a good experience with OCTA being a part of their listening sessions uh, for previous uh, sessions regarding the OCTA scoping period for HOV lanes, uh, which included Alternative 1 and Alternative 2, the 2 4 2045 LRT Long Range Transportation Plan LRTP and I just wanted to thank you for for taking this opportunity or giving us this opportunity uh, to, to make to present this um, PowerPoint presentations and to listen to us thank you so much I appreciate it thank you Amanda and now I'd like to call in Michael Assay are you able to speak I see that you've put in the Q&A that you'd like to speak, but I'm not sure if you raised your hand. Are we able to help um, Michael on I, I think Michael might have already dropped off. Oh, okay. All right, we'll move on to George Gregory. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Very good. Uh, thank you for adopting Save My Beaches. Uh, that was my campaign slogan two decades ago. Uh, past council has always counted on a magic storm to throw up many, many yards of sand up onto our beaches. Obviously, they were wrong. Um, if we lose our train, we will be alone in our combat to keep the, be the beaches in our community. Uh, these studies inland to move the train would more than fund sand replenishment on our beaches. That's a shameful behavior. Also, we know engineers engineer cost overruns. It's just their nature to feather their beds. So if you look at what engineering has to do right now, get rid of the sediments at Prado Dam, there's no excuse for the trains not bringing that sediment, sand, which is sand, down to our beaches here. Instead, they're trying to propagate a cost overrun. They're trying to propagate a calamity that is going to hurt our community. So that, that kind of behavior needs to help. Stop. It's very selfish. I want to also talk about selfishness in our community, in our community, our fault, because we've created a, a beach trail that doesn't include handicapped people, bicycle riders, electric bikes, etc. We need to create more love in our community, more love for the beach trail, so we get more people behind saving our beaches. Otherwise, you're going to wind up with just a trussle and riprap up and down our coast. That would be unacceptable for everybody. So it's madness. What's going on is madness right now and incompetence. One of the maddest things I've ever seen is taking – the, the soils, the spoils of these landslides and trucking them away at huge expense and started putting it on a beach where it will spread itself out as sand. That's what nature intended. That's, that's, that's just maddening and madness, if you ask me. These uh, clay ribbons and stuff we talk about are a majority of sand. If you go down El Camino Real right now between here and the DMV, I live at North Beach, Sorry, nobody knows that. You'll see it's all sand. And when it all wound up on the road there, it looked like big chunks of rocks. But after the water hit it, it's all sand. It's crazy to truck this stuff away. It's supposed to be on the beach. And this is why our beach is eroded, because we're not replenishing it. Without erosion, we don't have beaches. And without common sense, we don't clear up the sedimented Prado Dam, and we don't replenish our beaches. Now, that erosion is quite a ways away from us, but it is blocked by weird co concrete culverts and things like that. So what we need is some common sense, folks. We really, really do. 
and, and, and it's a shame that we don't let bicycle riders on the beach. Uh, um, it's a shame that we can't use our common sense. And it's a shame that we're being held hostage by engineers who want to create cost overruns and abuse our public. That's Thank all I can say. You. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Gregory. Um, now I'd like to call on Ken. And after Ken, then there's a few folks that spoke previously that want to say um, another brief, a brief comment. So I'll come back to you. So Ken, if you could, we could unmute you so you may speak. We can hear. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, thank you. Thanks for doing this. I'm just look. I, I live in North Beach as well as George there, and I'm looking at the proposal to throw down some more riprap, which we we've already beat the heck out of that. As far as what what happened down south when you put the riprap down, it pretty much killed our killed the beaches there. But but we also have a spot in North Beach um, just before the Mariposa Bridge, where where you all just did that repair work, which we appreciate, um, where we have a, a bridge, a rail bridge, basically, and water goes in there at high tide you know, pretty aggressively. And I'm just kind of wondering how more riprap is going to be put in front of that rail bridge, because you got to stop that water too, or you're going to have, eventually have water coming up under the rail bridge into the trail, and of course, creating problems underneath that track. So I would just caution you to take a look at that. And of course, North Beach is not interested in more riprap. Um, the water already comes up to the tracks with the riprap. So we don't see how that is a, a good solution. And we certainly don't need the water under the tracks drawing down you know, from the uh, hillside on the other side like it's happened down south. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to read a comment from Charlie Fox. He said, will you um, ensure adequate sand and beach is placed in front prior to any rebuilding of revetment riprap? If not, these problems will continue and hasten erosion. Now I'd like to go back for a brief comment from Steve Lang, followed by Tony Nelson. So Steve um, Lang, if you're able to unmute, please do so, or we'll unmute you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I just want to echo and uh, and say I appreciate Tony Nelson, uh, Greg Ray, Dr. Susie Whitelaw, and Jeffrey Burgermeister's comments. Uh, if if there was a natural beach sand buffer at Cotton's Point, the train wouldn't have stopped. I don't know, at least half a dozen or a dozen times in the last year. And with a big south swell and a high tide, the water breaks right up over the riprap and, and the trains, I've seen them stop multiple times. We live right there and back up and stop all traffic. If there was a sand buffer where the waves could dissipate their energy, that would not be a problem. I just wanna say thanks to all the speakers and thank you, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Ling. Um, one more written comment I just noted, uh, Michael Laubach, excuse me for mispronouncing your name, as a homeowner on the bluff near marker 204, we have not been requested permission for placing vibration monitors on our property. I do see any reason to not permit this monitoring. So that was a comment. And now I will go back to Tony Nelson for another brief remark. Thank you so much for letting me um, speak again. You didn't read my entire question about the monitors. I was trying to distinguish between the types of monitors that you have put in place. I understand that you do have motion monitors on some of the slopes, particularly at the Mariposa slide, which I understand is still moving. And I can understand why you have that because you want some warning in case, to tell the trains to get out of the way if the thing starts moving again. Um, but I specifically was asking about two other types of monitors that are well known to geologists. One is a vibration monitor and the other one is a moisture monitor. I spoke to a geologist who was astounded that you do have, are not taking core samples to check on how wet these bluffs are. They do this in other countries. There's a lot of references to it in geological studies and they talk about uh, trains actually ceasing operations during rainy seasons because of the danger. And there's a lot of, you know, blaming bluff owners for slides. The moisture is causing the slides. 
And then you're what you're doing is vibrating heavy freight trains next to them. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's Godzilla right next to a bowl of jello. If you start shaking, you're going to get some liquefaction. You're going to get some movement. It's just common sense. So I really encourage you to look into that and to invest in some monitors. And I suspect that most bluff owners would be more than happy to cooperate with you, as the other gentleman was saying, because that protects all of us. We need information. We can't keep hiding from information. And my second point was, I want to ask you specifically, are you or are you not actually conducting a cost-benefit analysis? I've been watching these sessions for a long time. I've spoken at your OCTA meetings. I've read all your materials. I see no evidence of any cost-benefit analysis. I think one of the big problems is that you are operating from a paradigm that the train is a given, that it is just so incredible that you can't possibly live without the train. But we've investigated the supposed benefits and they are really pretty minor. Uh, and they certainly do not compare to the mountains and mountains of costs, both financial and environmental, that you would put on the other side in a proper cost benefit analysis. So I urge you to do that. I know you're not doing it. You have the, the financial costs, but you've got to look at the environmental costs. And you really need to go up to 30,000 feet and look at this whole line and think about it. It just doesn't make sense. And considering the seven miles in um, San Clemente, independently from the two miles that are about to fall into the ocean in Del Mar is ridiculous. It's all one line. You have to consider both of these danger areas in tandem. I just like to see OCTA taking that practical approach and looking at costs and benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now conclude the listening session portion of this evening and be moving on to the next slide. This is the upcoming listening session schedule. Um, as stated, all of the presentations during all of the listening sessions, January through May, um, will be included on the website. Um, we will have the PowerPoint presentations as well as the recordings. Those will be available. Um, so this evening will be included. We do have two public sessions coming up, um, one virtual session for the general public on April 11th and another in-person session on May 30th that is occurring at San Clemente City Hall. We have, again, mailed out a postcard regarding that, but additional details are also available on our website. Um, I encourage everyone to visit our website regularly. We post information in a very timely manner, and all updates regarding the study are available there. Everybody that's participating this evening will be added on our database, so any future notifications regarding the study you will receive. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I, again, I encourage you to also send um, either Dan or myself, emails. We, we're including our documentation there as well. Um, and again, visiting the project website is also a wonderful resource for you to explore. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a nice evening.